back to what I was talking about on Monday. And Monday, I was talking about the concept of boiling. So I better warn you, it's time for some of Dr. White's uh, standing out artwork, if not. All right, let's assume you have a beaker or a pot of water. And if you're in the lab, you have a Bunsen burner underneath. There's your flame. And when it heats up, you'll see little bubbles in here. And they go to the surface and collapse. Now, what's in that bubble? The water vapor. And uh, some definitions I'm doing now, I will never ask on tests, but it'll help you understand the concept of boiling. Oh, good news, I finally figured out last night after I uploaded Monday's lecture how to lighten the video, so they'll be improving. All right, so evaporation is when molecules escape from a liquid to gas phase. So if I were to put some water on here, or worse, gasoline, if you come back tomorrow, it's probably going to be gone if nobody even wiped it up because it evaporated, it became a gas from a liquid. And it's, evaporation happens at different temperatures, and the higher the temperature, higher the temperature, the quicker evaporation happens. How many of you have ever seen water drop on the high part of a stove, all of a sudden it becomes a gas, and that's evaporation. Now, the important aspect of evaporation is it takes energy for that to happen. And an important part in our life where that plays a role is when you are overheating. And what does that happen when you do exercise, when I play tennis or you a runner, which I'm not, and men perspire or sweat and women perspire. And what happens, you have a liquid water on your skin. And what happens is, in being on your skin, that water goes from, a, from the heat from your body, goes from a liquid to a gas. Now that takes energy, heat, and that withdraws the heat from your body. And that's how you get cooled off when you perspire if you're a woman or sweat if you're a man. Actually, it's the same thing but it sounds more polite. And uh, if you've ever seen football games in hot weather, you'll see on the side of the, uh, on the sidelines, they'll have fans blowing water spray onto the players. And what that does is it evaporates the wind from the fan, helps it evaporate even more, and then what happens is that cools down the players. And that's a good thing. Now, another place where that happens is in cooling towers. And if you've ever seen cooling towers, like this one right over here, what happens is they pump water in there through pipes. And the water is warm. And also in the cooling tower, you have water spraying down or cascading over the pipes that are inside. And then what happens is you have a fan on top. See those right here are fans. And they pull up air through these vents. And that evaporates the water coming on the pipes. And that causes the water in the pipes to cool down. And so really what these are are a way of cooling a liquid that's going through the cooling tower. Now, my knowledge of cooling towers saved my life once and those of other people. True story. Uh, I was running a reaction first time at a company in Morris, Illinois that I used to work for. Their research was in McCook, no longer there by Brookfield Zoo, but the production plant in Illinois was in Morris. And we were doing this reaction, and in a vessel we call a reactor, we had 40,000 pounds of chemical. And for those that aren't familiar with how much that is, have you ever seen the vehicle that delivers gasoline to a gas station? Those are called tank wagons. They're standardized. Whether it's for milk, gas, or chemicals, 40,000 pounds, 5,000 gallons. So one of those full was in this reactor. Add another 5,000 pounds of hydrogen gas, 
and another 5,000 pounds of liquid ammonia. It's pretty dangerous what's in there. And think of the mountain there, approximately the amount that would be in a swimming pool. And the temperature is going up because it's a reaction that gives off heat. That was the first time we ran it in the plant in which I was there supervising, or helped supervising. And all of a sudden, the temperature took off. Here you have the amount of liquid the size of a swimming pool. And within 30 seconds, it went from 130 degrees C up to 180 degrees C. And it was still rising. And the question was, when will it explode? And if it exploded, everybody within a couple hundred yard radius would be dead. And here I am in the control room. One guy's ready to hit the, pull the alarm to evacuate the whole plant. And people are looking at me. And I knew something about the plant manager that was, to save money to look good to management, upper management, he tried to do everything to cut his cost, which is a good thing. Well, they had a cooling tower with three fans. And to cut costs, he only kept one running. And it was, I knew that. So immediately when I'm seeing that, and also at that point, I and others in the room got very close to God. We prayed a lot. And, but anyway, as I said, the guy who's by part of the control board, how many fans are on? He said, you know what? I said, turn the other two now on. And he did. And all of a sudden, we saw, because of the extra cooling from the fans evaporating more water, the temperature finally steadied. I did another thing. There was hydrogen gas still coming in to feed the reactor. I had that cut back down, but not enough to ruin it, because I didn't want to ruin my reaction either. But I still wanted to be alive. And lo and behold, uh, it cooled off, and we ran the reaction. It was successful. Oh, in case you're wondering, I live. <laughs> True story. And so that's why I know about cooling top towers, because they saved my life or knowledge of it. All right, let's get back to boiling water, which I think you're all familiar with. And what happens is, you can form what's called a vapor. I'm not going to ask you the definition of a vapor ever on a uh, test. But that's the gaseous molecule substances or molecules that are <coughs> gas at a temperature where they would normally be a liquid or a solid. And if you were to measure the space above my water bottle, it has air but it also has some water molecules that are in a gas form, and we call that vapor. Now, whether people call, when it's water vapor in the air, we call that humidity. And you know when it's high humidity, it's not comfortable, it's not like high humidity. But that's water vapor. Now, two more terms I want to teach you, and this will never be on a test, is equilibrium. Equilibrium is a condition in which two opposite processes take place at the same time. If I were to do this and this, am I moving anywhere? No, because I'm in equilibrium going forward and backward at the same rate. Well, it turns out that when you have evaporation, you have the liquid becoming a gas, but at the same time, above here, this gas becomes a liquid. And it's at the same speed or rate, we call that equilibrium. And the vapor pressure, since you have a gas and vapor is just a gas, a uh, gas is something that should be a liquid, you can measure the pressure, how many uh, millimeters of mercury, how many torr, how many atmosphere, and that's the vapor pressure. Now, it turns out, that is an equilibrium when you have vapor pressure over a liquid. It's an equilibrium. What's coming in and going out is at the same rate. And just to throw another term at you, a volatile substance is something that evaporates at room temperature very quickly because it has a high vapor pressure. It forms a lot of vapor. Gasoline is volatile because it forms a vapor very easily, gas, which is flammable and dangerous. All right, let's get to the good stuff. All right, what's boiling? 
boiling, any ball, I'm going to assume everybody in here has seen boiling water at one time in their life, and hopefully more than once. And boiling is a special form of evaporation where the conversion of a liquid state to the vapor state occurs within the liquid body of the liquid through bubble formation. I'll never ask you what's boiling on the test. And if we look at here, if this is boiling, the liquid forms a gas inside its own liquid, we call those bubbles, and it comes to the surface and collapses. And when that happens, it releases water vapor. All right, switch is on. Ooh, I got everybody right. Ooh, does that work well? Anyways, the boiling point of a liquid is the temperature at which the vapor pressure is equal to the external pressure, which we call atmospheric pressure, exerted on the liquid. So, if we're here in Chicago land, here in Glen Ellen, we're about zero sea level. And the pressure is about 760 torr, one atmosphere, plus there's a storm front coming in, then it varies a little, gets lower or a little higher. And what that means is, when I boil water here, one, at the boiling point, which is the temperature, the vapor pressure equals the atmospheric pressure. temperature at the boiling point or boiling temperature boiling point at the boiling point temperature at that point the vapor pressure of the liquid being boiled equals the atmospheric pressure. And that temperature you measure with great artwork now. I told you I was a great artist. You can all laugh, have weights, and permit. <laughs> and you measure the temperature, and that's the boiling point. Now, in Chicago land, Glen Ellen here, the boiling point of water is 100 degrees C to 12 Fahrenheit. What happens if you go to Denver? How many of you have ever been to Denver? I've been there. That's called the Mile High City. Why? Because it's not at sea level. It's a mile high from sea level. In case you didn't know that. Notice Google never fails. And if you go to Denver, you'll find if you were to measure a boiling point of water, it's only 95 degrees C, not 100. And if you know anybody who lives in Denver, which I do, and visited them, and what you'll see is if they buy noodles or rice, there's a sticker on the package that they have to cook it longer. Why? Because the temperature is lower when you cook rice or noodles in boiling, point, in boiling water there than here in Glen Ellen. And therefore, it takes more time to cook it. Now, let's really go up high. And don't you love search engines? And if you go up to the top of the Himalayas, like Kathmandu or somewhere like that, which I'll probably never go to, but I know about. A good song by, I forgot who did it. But anyways, you'll find the boiling point of water is 90 
and it takes a lot longer to cook food. Why? Because you're at a higher ele ele elevation. Now, you should know, as you go higher elevation from our planet, from the ground level, the atmosphere pressure reduces. So why is Denver or top of the Himalayans a lot lower than here, the boiling point? Because there's less vapor pressure. And because, or atmosphere pressure, and because there's less atmosphere pressure, you need less vapor pressure to equal that, therefore you need less heat, lower temperature. I'll say that again, you should know this. What happens to the temperature and why of the boiling point of water when you go higher? What happens is, because as you go to higher atmosphere, the atmospheric pressure will reduce, and therefore you need less energy to equal, have the vapor pressure equal that, and because you need less energy, you have a lower boiling point. Now, if you're a fan of science fiction, which I am, if you haven't read Asimov, you're missing a lot in life, uh, the Foundation Trilogy is probably one of the best science fiction ever written, but if you're not familiar with it, one of the lines you see in many different stories, books, and movies is, if you want to kill someone in outer space, you throw them out the spaceship without a spacesuit on. Or if you ever see a movie where their spacesuit gets punctured, the person dies. Why? Well, one way, and it's quite gruesome, is they explode. Why do they explode? Because you have water in your blood, you're in outer space, the pressure is almost zero, and therefore your blood starts boiling, forming a vapor, and it's not going to stay contained, and you go pop like a balloon. That's pretty safe. But anyways, that's science fiction, and I don't really want to see that. But now the opposite of that is what happens if you boil something in an uh, at area, atmosphere, where it's a much higher pressure? And we have a name for that. How many of you have ever seen or used a pressure cooker? Wow. How many of you have missing something, not really, in life? If you look at a pressure cooker here, and I have no idea if it's good or not, what a pressure cooker does is you put food in here, usually wine or water or something like that along with it, you seal this, and this seals it tight. It lets a little bit of steam, which is a vapor, out, and what that does is greatly increases the pressure inside the vessel. Because it's a higher pressure, the boiling point of water in there is much higher temperature, and therefore your food cooks much quicker. Now, me personally, I've never used a pressure cooker because I think they're dangerous, even though I know people disagree with me. Because if the safety relief valve doesn't work, this blows up like a can grenade. I haven't heard of that in many years because they used to make cheap ones. But having worked with high pressure gases in a lab and a plant, much higher than that, I know how dangerous it is, so I stay clear of this. But you should know, one, when you go to a higher altitude on our planet, the boiling point goes down. When you go to a higher altitude, the lower the boiling point. Why? Because you have a much lower atmospheric pressure. You need less energy to meet that pressure to make things boil. And if you go the opposite way, 
the higher the pressure in a pressure cooker, the higher the boiling point. So those are two things you should know about uh, boiling. And the next time you personally have to boil water, and also you watch someone boiling water, you can say, you know those bubbles in the water? That's water vapor. Water in a gas form coming out. And you can impress them with your knowledge of chemistry. And the normal boiling point is at 760 torr or millimeters of mercury, one atmosphere. All right, everybody, first of all, click the switch. Will this be on a test? Is off, but it's something interesting to learn about. So I do want to cover it in your book. And that is volume and bowls. And Avogadro's law. Ooh, I've heard that name before. So have you. Avogadro's number. Why did Avogadro get honored with the number 6.02 times 10 to the 23rd? Because it deals with moles. And Avogadro did a very important research, groundbreaking research, many, many centuries ago, I think in the 1800s, uh, dealing with gases, how much and the concept moles. And what he found was the volume of a gas is directly related to the number of moles of a gas when the temperature and pressure are not changed. So he was able to find a relationship <coughs> with volume of a gas and moles, how many molecules. And this can be derived by the ideal gas law, which I'll teach you later today. Not how to drive it, but it is. And what he found, first of all, was when you work at STP, the switch is still off, and STP is not the oil uh, additive, but anybody ever hear of STP oil additive? Well, anyways, never mind. Back when I was a student, uh, undergrad, uh, let's just say, the relationship between students and the police in Chicago and elsewhere were not good, and you used to see students wearing the STP stickers on their coats or other things, and then SDP also stood for Stop the Pigs, which was an acronym for police. But that's enough for history. Let's get back to SDP. And chemistry means standard temperature and pressure. You're at 273 Kelvin, zero degrees C, one atmosphere. And at that point, at that pressure and temperature, Avogadro was able to find that one mole of a gas equals 22.4 liters. And because of this discovery, they were able to look, chemists, others, into finding out other information about moles, which is quite important. All right, I have everybody's attention. If I, could, I just turn the switch, click back on. If it was a dial that went up to 10, I just turned it to 20. One thing. There we go. I don't know how that got in there, but the ideal gas law. The ideal gas law is an equation that indicates the quantity of gas in a sample, temperature, pressure and volume of a sample. I'll never ask you what's the ideal gas law in words, but you should know how to use it. And the ideal gas law is PV equal nRT. In all of chemistry, this is one of the most useful mathematical equations I know, other than the mole concepts. Dr. White loves PV equal nRT. And PV equal nRT, what's P? P is pressure in atmosphere. What's V? V is volume in liters. What's N? N is the number of moles. But I don't know about you, but I've never seen a balance that measures out moles, but does measure grams or weight. And you know how to go from grams to moles and moles to grams. 
And next, T is temperature, and the temperature is always in Kelvin. And finally, R is called the universal gas law constant. You can find R in very different units. The one I'll use for this class is 0.0821, and the units are atmospheres, liters, times divided by moles Kelvin. Now, R is a calculated number. And if you notice, since it's a calculated number, the number I have on the screen is three significant figures. One afternoon when I had some time to waste, which is sometimes rare, but I did, I found a reputable website that had R to 18 significant figures. Now why anybody would ever need R to 18 significant figures, I have no idea, but someone took the time to figure it out to that measure. It. But in this class we'll use 0.821. Now, this is very important. In order for this equation to work, PV equal nRT, the different variables have to be in these units. If you use pressure and torque, it won't work. Uh, I will always give it to you in millimeters of mercury or torque, and you're going to have to know how to convert to atmospheres, which we've already done. But we'll do a problem or two in a little while. And V is in volume, in liters. I will always give you a problem. If I give you a volume, I'll give it to you in liters, even though some instructors do milliliters and you've got to convert it by dividing that number by 1,000 to liters. I don't do that. N is moles. You know how to go from grams to moles, but we'll practice it again. T is temperature. You know that's degree C plus 70, 273. And R is the universal gas law. Now, notice I have learned that. In the past, I would have on the screen memorized this. On this page, other than to learn it, this and all of this, I will put important information for test number three, which is my gift to you today. So you don't have to memorize things. You set to learn how to do the chemistry. Now, before we go into a TV equal NRT problem, let's look at a practical application that you should know about for PV clone RT. Remember, the dial is turned up to 20, even though it really only goes up to 10. That's how important it is. I think you're all familiar with the part of a car called the tires. And the tires are the round things made of rubber. And if you were taking organic chemistry, I'd be teaching you what rubber is. And we'll do a little at the end. Maybe I'll throw it in there. But anyways, tires have air or nitrogen inside to keep them inflated. So you have a nice, smooth ride. And PV equal NRT teaches you something about your tires. And what it teaches you is when to check the pressure. Because it's important to make sure your tires are properly inflated. Otherwise, they'll blow out or go flat on you or just you'll have serious problems. Now, let's think about two times a year that are important. One coming up soon is winter. And if you were around here last winter, you know it got brutally cold when they closed down the school, which I was grateful. In the past, the previous presidents would never close down the school. I know I had to come here in a bad snowstorm and some cold weather. But when you saw the daytime temperature being about 25 degrees minus 25 degrees Fahrenheit, and that's not the wind chill, make you wonder, will the liquid around your eyes freeze, even though there's salt in there? But still, I was wondering, do I want to risk walking from the parking lot here and having serious medical problems? You know, I do have goggles I could have put on, ski goggles, but no, they close the school. But what happens in the winter? In the winter, the temperature goes down really down. And you know that from being in Chicago with. Well, what does PV equal an RT teach you for your tire? The volume of your tire is not going to change unless you get a flat. I hope that doesn't happen. 
uh, last semester. It actually happened twice to me. But anyways, the number of moles is not going to change because the amount in the tire should stay the same. R is a constant. So in your tire, those three variables will not change. So if in the winter the temperature goes down, what should you think about? The pressure in your tire is going to go down too. And PV equal NRT tells you that. So when it gets brutally cold out, you should check your car tires. And true story, not this last winter, because I have a semi-heated garage, also I didn't have to drive here because the school was closed. But uh, many years ago, well, it was about 1995. How many of you, I'm not going to ask, how many of you weren't born in 1995? That's going to make me steer. But anyway, in 1995, I was living not far from here in Schaumburg. I was living in an apartment complex, which meant you parked your car outside in the parking lot of that complex. And it was a fr uh, Friday night, and the nighttime temperature got down to something brutal, like minus 20 degrees F, and that was the wind chill. And the next morning, I figured, because I want to make sure my battery doesn't go bad. By the way, when the temperature goes very low, your battery gets slightly weaker. And if you don't have a good battery, it won't start your car. And if you are worried about that, you have a way of charging it, an alternator in your car. So in cold weather, it's good to go on your car for a while. So I went out about 8.30 next morning. It was still about 15 below. I was bundled up, and I have a SUV. And I go to the parking lot, and I look at my car, my SUV, and I look at Oh my goodness, I have four flat tires almost. And it took me about two seconds, all of a sudden this part of your brain said, no, PV equal NRT. The temperature went down, the pressure in your tires went really down. You better go fill them up, because it's still going to be cold for a while. And so I went over to a local gas station. Back then they still had free air everywhere. Now you got to look for it. I only know one place in my neighborhood that has it. But anyways, uh, and I got to the gas station, and I started filling my tires up because they needed it big time. And by the time I finished, it was only like about seven, five, seven minutes to fill all four tires. I look around, and there are about 15 cars waiting in line for me to finish. And I don't know if they knew about PV on our team, but they figured out, let's see if I have a flat or I just can fill it up. And remember, in the winter, you should know. Why should you check your tires and what equation tells you to check it? PV equal NRT. Now, the other time is the summer. And if you've been around here the last decade or so, you know we've had a couple of hot summers. About seven years ago, it got brutally hot. I remember coming teaching at night here and it was 5.30 and the outside temperature was like still 98 or, and then back in the mid 90s, oh again back then, uh, we had a summer where the daytime temperature for almost two weeks stayed above 100 Fahrenheit. And that's when unfortunately in Chicago and especially Chicago, close to 500 people died because of the heat. And that's why nowadays when it gets super hot in the summer, you hear on the radio and TV, check your neighbors and they have cooling centers. Back then they didn't, and that's what unfortunately those people died. But if you were driving around the highway, which I was, because I was working at a company in Gurney, a chemical company, and I'd take the highway, the toll roads there, you'd see along the roads, people pulled over with blowouts. How would you know that? You see scraps of tire right by where they pulled over, especially trucks. Why did that happen? Well, turns out PV equal NRT tells you that. How does it tell you that? Well, an entire V and an R stay constant, and therefore, in the summer, the temperature goes up, and what happens to the pressure in your tire? It goes up. 
And if it goes up too high, like a balloon, if you fill it up too much, it goes hot. And you have a blowout. So PV equal NRT is a very useful equation when it comes to your tires, because it tells you in the winter when the temperature goes down, your pressure and your tires go down, so you better go to a gas station unless you have your own compressor, and go ahead and check your tires. In the summer, if the temperature goes real high, you should check the pressure in your tires, because if it gets too high, guess what happens? They'll blow out. And I saw that enough on the highway. I was smart enough to know about PV one RT. I kept an eye on my tire pressure. All right, let's have some fun with PV one RT. I think you're all familiar with something we all do at one time or more in life, and that's burp. And when you burp, or sometimes people call it a belch, you exhale gas from your lungs, through your mouth. And that gas is mostly carbon dioxide when you burp. And let's have some fun with PV equal NRT. And let's look at the following. And let me remind you, if you ever see us on a piece of paper in the future sometimes, you'll see 15 points. Ooh, that's a lot of work. That's why it's a lot of points. If you burp 0.651 grams of CO2 at 26 degrees C, 753 torr, then what is the volume of your burp? That you never thought you could. I get into burps in here, but I do, and I'll get into other things you'll never think about later on. And so let's look at what are we being asked to find? A volume. What are we given? We're given a temperature, or let's first a weight. We're given a temperature. We're given a pressure, and on important information, you will also be given what R is in the units. Now, if you look at this right here, is anything changing? First of all, we're dealing with a gas. If you burp CO2, burp is a gas. Is anything changing? Variable. The answer is no. You're given a weight, you're given a temperature, you're given a pressure, and you're trying to find a volume. The giveaway is nothing is changing. Therefore, you know you should use PV equal NRT. Now, what are we trying to solve for in PV equal NRT? The volume. How do we solve for something? We get it alone on one side. All right, everybody relax. We're going to do some algebra. It's simple, but relax. How do I get something alone? Well, if I want to get rid of the P, P times V divided by P becomes V. Anything divided by itself becomes the number one. Well, whatever you do to one side, you have to do to the other. Bear with me so far. This divided by itself becomes one. One times V is V. 
and now we have this. Now, listen carefully. Common mistakes students make. They start putting these numbers in. You can't. Why? Because it has to be in the proper units. Pressure has to be in atmospheres. Oh no, it's not. I've got to convert it. Temperature has to be in Kelvin. It's not. I'm going to have to convert it. And it's moles. I don't have moles, but I have grams, so I'm going to have to convert that too. So let's get to work. Let's do N first, because I'm just starting this way. And N is moles. And we have 0 0.651 grams CO2 And I want to get the moles of CO2. How do I use that? Use your good buddy, your good friend, unit analysis. And whatever I'm trying to get, can you guys see this? Can you see that, Bob? Can you see that? So I'm make sure I don't write on the wall. <laughs> uh, anyways, now can you see it? Okay. It could happen. But anyways. Whatever I'm trying to get to goes on top. Whatever I'm trying to get rid of goes here. On test number three, like test number two, the important information will say one mole of a compound equals its molecular weight. It will also say the sum of atomic weights equals the molecular weight. So now I have to do the sum of the atomic weights, molecular weight, is for one mole equals the molecular weight of CO2. CO2 is one carbon, two oxygen. Remember, on test two, I will have on test three, please use all atomic weights, the three significant figures. Carbon is 12.0, one times that. Oxygen is 16.0. I've done the math correctly, 2 times 6, I did. It's 32, I'll add that up. It's 44.0. Remember, when you're adding, you get the same number of significant figures past the decimal as the number that has the fewest significant figures. You're adding 1, 1, 1, so this would be 44.0. And now, I'll come over here, open up my calculator, <coughs> and I'll come here and I'll put down This is the number my calculator gives me. Now, if you notice here, I have three significant exact number three. I can round it off at this point to three significant figures, or you can wait for the end. And as you've heard me say before, I'm of the round off at each step person, and you might be waiting until the end round off person. I calculate both ways, and the answers are different. Guess what? Both are the right answers. So. I'll have two columns going here. Round that off to three significant figures. It's this. All right, so now I have how many moles of CO2 I have. Well, that's done. Next are, well, I'm done there because that's a constant. So now I'll do temperature. And temperature in Kelvin, and this will be given to you, this formula, is degree C plus 273. My temperature in centigrade is 
26. Remember when you're adding the same number, number of significant figures past the decimal, you can close that factor if it's getting too noisy. If I can hear it, it's probably too noisy. Uh, but anyway, this is an exact number, none past the decimal, and I have 299 Kelvin. So I now have my temperature done. And last but not least, pressure. Pressure should be in atmospheres. And now I'll look at this and say, well, I've got it in tour. I want it in atmospheres, so now I'll use my good buddy, good you friend, unit analysis. Say if I want to get the atmospheres, I'll put that on top. I want to get the tour, I'll put that on bottom. I'll write over here just to remind you. learned earlier, you learned, because I already knew it, one atmosphere equals 760 torr equals 760 millimeters of mercury. This is the definition. Those numbers are exact numbers. This will also be given to you on important information. The past I had students memorize it, but not now. One atmosphere equals 760 torr, so I can fit, fit that in. get this number, and I'm going to round off at each step. You can wait until the end. We'll see what difference there is, if any. And if I round that off to three significant figures, why? Three, exact number, exact number. I now will round it off to 0 0.991. And now let's do the math. And if I come over here, Sorry about the board. Usually in other classrooms, there's a board behind the screen I can use. Obviously, this one doesn't have it. So, V equals number of moles, N, 1.48 times 10 to the minus 2 moles. Then I'll have R. space. So then I'll multiply it times temperature. And then I'll divide it by my pressure in atmospheres. Now, before I go to my calculator, I'm going to check that I set this up right. Now, once again, your good friend, your good buddy, unit analysis will help you. Forget about the bottom. If we look at the units on the top only, this is moles divided by moles. That cancels out. This is Kelvin divided by Kelvin. That cancels out. So this is gone. These units are gone. What do I have here? Atmospheres divided by atmospheres. That cancels out. What am I left with? Liters to measure volume. I'm on the right track. So I know I'm doing that good. Everybody with me on how what I just did? Okay, just to check. Now I'll go to my calculator.
Have you noticed either way you get the same answer because it should be three significant figures? Watch out, Dr. White's going to get very fancy. By the way, I've been using <coughs> spreadsheets since 1980. I was the first one of the first people in a company I worked for didn't know how to learn how to use a spreadsheet. But here I have 0 0.366, and to round that off to five, three significant figures, the number to round off is five, that becomes a seven. Same thing here, 0 0.366, the number to round off is a six, this becomes a seven. So the answer is, 0 0.367 liters. Now let's think about that. This bottle full is 700 milliliters, which is 0.7 liters. So if you have a good burp, the amount you expel is about half the volume of this bottle. That's a pretty good burp. People will hear that. And that's PV equal NRC. Oh, let's have some more fun. Any questions on this? Going once, twice. I did spell it right. Sometimes I spell balloon wrong. All right, if you have a balloon, Somebody decoded in case you haven't figured out how to read my handwriting yet. It's still 15 points. If a balloon filled with nitrogen gas, N2, at 31 degrees C, volume, or I gave it away, 2.11 liters, and at 742 torr, then what is the weight of the, and I guess I could put, of the nitrogen? Sorry about that. All right. I'm going to let you have some of the fun. Why don't you write down what are the variables and what are you being asked to find? Do that first. What time flies when you're having fun with PV equal NRT. Remember, this winter, check your tires because PV equal NRT tells you. All I'm asking you is, what are you trying to find? What are you given? Through this. First of all, the question is, 
What are you being asked to find? The weight. Grams of N2. That's weight. In this class, we use weight. Anybody see this? I wish this. Is that better? Is that any worse? Anyways, N2. What are you given? You're given a temperature, 31 degrees C. What's L? Liters. Liters is a volume. You're given the volume of the balloon. And what's tor? Tor is pressure. Now, we're dealing with a gas. Nitrogen, N2 is a gas. You should know that. Are right, so anything changing? Any of the variables changing? And the answer is no. So immediately, plus this is N2. Oh, I gave that away. Shucks. But anyways, PV equal MRT. But now you say, wait a second, Dr. White. We're trying to find grams. This is pressure. This is volume. This is moles. This is universal gas law constant, a number. This is temperature. I don't see grams in there. But wait. Test two. You know how to go from moles to grams. So this is two step. <laughs> First step will solve for N. How many moles of nitrogen? Second step will convert it to grams of nitrogen. So let's do step one. What am I trying to solve for? Solve for M. And because I'm not sure to find, why don't you, don't put any numbers in, see if you can solve and get N alone on one side. Again, you're going to solve, don't put any numbers in, just with the variables, how do you get N alone on one side and PV equal NRT? For those who came in late, let me remind you this Friday we're doing a little something different lab. Instead of starting out with where I go through a problem set, we're going to start out with the lab from the beginning. So as for my syllabus, if you're more than five minutes late, I reserve the right not to let you come in and do the lab, which means you'll lose 11 points. So please be on time on Friday. Friday, after the lab, which will take about an hour, those of you who want to, it's optional, stick around and go through important stuff from test two. If you got less than 70 on test two, I highly recommend, but it's optional, you stick around. It shouldn't be more than an hour, and you'll still get out early. So, but it will help you for the final and also test three. All right, let's go. And first thing that we have to do is solve for N. I want N alone on one side. I have to get rid of R and T. So how do I do that? When you're multiplying things together to get rid of things you don't want, divide by it. R divided by R becomes the number one. T divided by T becomes the number one. Whatever you do to one side, you have to do to the other. This cancels out. I'm left with N equals PV over RT. You don't have to do this, but Dr. White likes to do this. I'm going to turn it around. And now I have to get to work. Because first of all, I have to have the proper units. You can't put these numbers in. Because they're in the wrong units. And P V equal NRT will not work. And we'll do pressure in atmosphere. 
and we have 742 tor. We want to go to atmospheres. I'll use unit analysis. What I'm trying to get to goes on top. What I'm trying to get rid of goes underneath. Where do I get those numbers? I had earlier on the board, no good important information. <coughs> Excuse me. One atmosphere equals 760 torr. Therefore, I know I can put this in here, this in here. This cancels out. I'm left with atmospheres. And now I'll go to my calculator. I'm the round off each step person. You can wait till the end. I'll calculate both ways. And now I have V. Next, I need V, but V is already in liters, so I can just put this down. And next, R is the universal gas law constant, which will be given. Finally, I'm left with temperature, and temperature in Kelvin equals degree C plus 273, and my temperature is 31 degrees C. Make sure I did my math correctly. This one I did in my head. And now I'm ready to go. I know the math, I'm going to show you, you don't have to, but when you have something divided by 1 over x, that number becomes x. And therefore, this moles will come on top, this is units on top is 1, units up here is 1, nothing there, divided by moles, here x is moles. So I'll end up with the units moles. I'm on the right track. It's a little complex, but uh, if you have any questions, Friday I'll show you on the board how that actually works. And now let me put the stuff in. Common mistake students make on test three, when they're putting in R, they put in 0.821. Don't forget the zero. I'm telling you that so you know. And finally, we're left with 
what's the last thing I have to put there, and that's the temperature. Now, am I done? No, because the number I have here is, eight, I'll write it in scientific notation, the three significant figures times 10 to the minus 2 moles of nitrogen. Is that what I'm trying to find? And the answer is no, because we come back here, I'm trying to find grams of nitrogen. Now I have to do step two. you learn for test two and you still need it for test three, and you'll see when we get into the next chapter, you'll still need to know how to go from grams to moles to moles to grams. I want to get the grams of nitrogen. I want to get rid of moles, so I'll put the moles here. I'll put the grams there. And what do you know? One mole of a compound equals its molecular weight. And the molecular weight is the sum of the atomic weights. So for nitrogen, I've just got enough room on the board, it's got two nitrogens, nitrogen gas is N2, and therefore it's two nitrogen. If you look on the periodic table, and there are a few of them I know by heart, and this is one of them, and that's two times 14.0 to three significant figures, which is 28.0. And one mole equals 28.0. Moles divided by moles cancel out. Therefore, I now, the number in purple, I'll multiply times If you look at, I'm going to put it in bold, the number in bold, am I good or am I good, you'll see it's the same number to three significant figures, 2.3. In case you were wondering, if you had a balloon at 31 degrees C, 2.11 liters, and 742 torr, the weight of that nitrogen is 2.31 grams. And that's PV equal nRT. PV equal nRT tells you how to calculate important things. What are these used for? They're used for things like calculating important parameters for your car engine cylinders, for other things where you're using gases, and that's how it's important. And as you also learned today, PV equal NRT tells you when to test your tires. Now, when you go home today, check over, look out in the parking lot, and see those tires on the cars and say, ooh, they've got gas in them, and I know how to interpret what will happen to the pressure when the temperature changes. And when you go home, if you happen to boil some water, have fun. Let's see. 
I've got two minutes. Quick safety thing. This will never be on a test. You boil water in a beaker, the beaker is very smooth. When you work in a pot, even though it feels smooth, it's very rough. And those rough surfaces have help bubbles form. Now, when you're boiling in gas, and I think we'll do it once a semester, uh, in glass, water, so you have to put it in boiling ships, which give it a rough surface. Why am I telling you this? How many of you have ever boiled water in a microwave? You've got to be careful, because you know how it sometimes pops out? I always put a piece of rice in there. It's a rough surface and helps stop that. With that, I'm going to let you out a whole minute or so early. Remember, be on